yeah, I'm here today to talk about three topics which are really close. I'm going to stand on that side because that's in my eyes. Really close to my heart, diversity, inclusion, and talent acquisition. Um, for me, diversity means difference. And I've always thrived on uh, meeting new people, understanding different ways of thinking, challenging my own ways of thinking. Um, also, traveling to new places, experiencing new cultures. So for me, that's a little bit about what diversity is. Inclusion, when I think of inclusion, I think about creating an environment where everyone feels able to be themselves and comfortable to be themselves. Um, and I often kind of look at how that manifests itself in the workplace versus in social scenarios. When we're with uh, people that we choose to be with, our mates, our friends, our family, we're often at ease and having a good time and enjoying ourselves. But often when we're pushed into environments in the workplace that we might be with people that we're not you know, typically select to be with, then the culture can be a bit different and it's maybe not so inclusive. So some of my thoughts on inclusion. And then talent acquisition, last but not least, I, I love TA. I'm a recruiter by trade. Um, spent the first eight years of my career in recruitment delivery, mixture of permanent recruitment, contract recruitment and exec search. And in the last five or so years, I've been uh, in talent acquisition and HR transformation consulting. So that's a little bit about me. Um, pleased to meet all of you guys, and hopefully the next half an hour or so is thought-provoking and interesting. I know there's some, lots of people in the crowd that I've met, so I'm expecting some heckling in the Q&A. Um, so what are we going to talk about today? Um, we, uh, on top of the day job, I run something in the UK called the Think Talent Community, uh, which is basically all of IBM's clients, um, or many of IBM's clients, and it's a give back to their HR and talent functions whereby we research hot topics. And at the beginning of the year, we were asked to look into DNI. So we've kind of just culminated a few months ago this piece of research. And today, I'm going to basically share the data and the output of that at a high level. Um, so I hope that's interesting. And it's not, I think I, I, think I heard Tim, maybe one of your speakers earlier, say it wasn't death by PowerPoint. There's one slide. We've got a lot of slides today, which I'll be whistling through. But hopefully, it's useful stuff. And it's not, it's not really IBM opinion. It's market research. Um, the things that we looked at here on the screen, we wanted to know how organizations are creating a culture of inclusion, what they're doing to activate DNI initiatives, where's the interlock with the resourcing function and the TA function, how are they integrated and how that, how's that working. Um, I've then got a few slides to talk about neurodiversity. Uh, it's a, that's a topic that's growing more and more. Um, we've got a good case study that I'm going to share from IBM around that um, and a few sort of thoughts and personal sort of interests around that. We'll talk a little bit about tech, um, not too much. And then we'll finish up with some of the um, some, some sort of thoughts on the challenges and opportunities for anyone in the room who's TA, which I imagine is the great majority of us. Um, so this is the benchmark. These are the organizations that we spoke to, 36 companies in total. If any of anyone here is representing those brands today, thanks for taking the time to take part. The format is a, a one-hour interview. So we go and meet with their head of TA or um, resourcing. In this case, also quite a lot of folks from HR, the business, and DNI got involved. Um, we do one-hour interviews. We ask lots of questions. And then that culminates in a body of research and a half-day workshop where we get together, we share that research, we co-create. So we actually built a maturity model together at the last workshop, which if anyone's interested in seeing that, reach out to me and I can share the paper and all the information. So. When we, were, when we do these half-day workshops, we, we, similar to like today, we use Slido to gain some information. And what I've brought with me is a couple of the data points from the workshops as well. So when we started off this workshop with, all, with about 60 or so HR and recruitment folks, we said, why do you think DNI is a key talent priority? And these were the four bits that come up. Innovation, I think having a more diverse uh, workforce enables creative thinking, innovative thinking. Um, widen talent pools. When we talk about neurodiversity later, apart from getting more people maybe with an ASC into the workplace, autism spectrum condition into the workplace, it makes business sense. We all got scarce skills challenges in the STEM and other skill sets. And actually, if we can widen up our talent pools through non-conventional um, you know, areas, then we're going to improve like, business outcomes as well as doing the right thing for society and everyone ensuring sort of fairness. Um, improve retention and business growth as well. So those were some of the things that were shared in the workshop. So now I'm going to start going through this research. And the first bit was we wanted to look at how are organizations creating a culture of inclusion. Um, and we wanted to know about the shape of the organization. So how are companies investing in DNI? Um, and what we can see is sort of four out of five companies had a specific DNI role. I kind of maybe expect that to be 100%. So you know with how 
how much publicity and how much importance DNI's got over the last two or three years, and it's been growing and growing, but not everyone has. About half of the organizations had a dedicated DNI team, and 69% measured DNI. And I'll come back to this a couple of times as we go through the next half hour or so. A lack of systems and tools to actually measure your DNI performance, your outcomes, and how that's actually improving your organization means companies can't take that back to the exco in terms of here's the business case, this is why we're doing it, this is what the outcome for our organization is. And the knock on effect in that is sometimes a lack of investment. So measurement of DNI, measurement of performance is really important. Almost all of the organizations had an interlock with the talent acquisition function. Um, but only three and five TA functions were accountable for outcomes. So if you think about the different points in the recruitment process, selection decisions often sit with the business. Internal recruitment sometimes sits with the business. Um, so if your TA leadership team and your whole sort of TA function that works alongside that aren't accountable for diversity in the true sense, then who is, where's the handoff, how does that work? So some sort of interesting thoughts there. We then wanted to know about strategy and budget. Only 61% of companies have a DNI budget. A lot of companies are doing this on the fly, like little pilots, you know, maybe building out a resource group that we'll talk about. Um, and frankly, that's not good enough. If you've got exec sponsorship, then why isn't there budget? Why isn't it important enough? It goes back to the business case. Something to think about, it's interesting. Um, and when we ask about strategies, these are the strategies that you can see. So the top one, creating a culture of inclusion enables more diverse talent attraction. And that's what I'm going to focus on. I'm going to talk a little bit about how we do that at IBM. Um, and you know, uh, one big thing, and the next slide will show this, is through doing business resource groups. And um, we'll talk about that in a second. Events and networking, leadership support, training. Um, not as high as I'd have thought it would be. About 15% said they're looking at training strategies. So we've done something. We created a badge at IBM. It was called the Be Equal Badge. Um, for anyone that's not familiar with badging, basically it's a certification that you can take after your employment with any, any company. So you go through um, an education program, and we designed this Be Equal training. So it's about four to six hours, I think, approximately of education. Um, a mixture of digital video content, basically looking at people from all different diverse groups and their experiences about getting into the workplace and then being in the workplace. So recruitment and then, I guess, like engagement and, and retention in the workforce. Um, and it was really thought-provoking to watch about 10 or 15 different videos. Half of them, when I went through the training, I was like, oh, yeah, I kind of get that. Half was like, oh, I would never put myself in those shoes. And that's really interesting. Um, on top of that, there was the practical ap application of that training through joining some of the resource groups, um, making a pledge uh, around how you're going to ensure equality in the workplace and things like that. So that was an example of what we did. Pr pretty low cost and pretty good outcomes in certain markets and certain business areas. That was mandated. So you have to do your B equal badge. And I guess first step to improving or helping with culture and is, is, you know, is awareness and training. So that's, that's something. Surveys, there's a little bit about performance management as well, which is interesting. Some of the companies that we spoke to have built it into their expectations around performance to be basically DNI friendly, to ensure equality in the workplace. And people were being rated on that by their organizations. And that also linked to um, promotion or uh, you know, pay rises or in you know, potentially disciplinaries as well. So that's sort of an interesting concept when we think about how we're enforcing, or not enforcing is maybe the wrong word, but you know, trying to encourage from all different avenues um, a more inclusive culture in the workplace. So business resource groups, um, hands up in the room if a company you work for has a BRG or an employee resource group. Okay, I was expecting a few more hands than that. So ef effectively then, a resource group is really just a community, um, and you can see some of the different communities that um, were, were cited here, um, whether it's to do with sexual orientation, gender, ethnicity, disability, and so on. Um, and you hear a lot about business resource groups being inclusive. So it's not necessarily about, you know, we're going to get all women in tech together and it's only going to be women in tech. It actually, to be, to be, not to be exclusive, if you want it to be inclusive, then you need to get allies and you need to get all people involved in these, di in, in, in these different groups. Um, and I'll talk a little bit around how that links to then talent ac ac attraction from an offline talent attraction perspective. Um, Almost everyone that we spoke to had an ERG, four and five, and 36% had five employee resource groups. So this is a great way, if you're in the business or HR, if you've not got these, then you should be setting up resource groups tomorrow. Um, if you're in talent attraction, 
then the key thing, and we'll move on to an IBM case study in a second, is how do you partner with these? So I'm going to show you like a video in a minute that will talk about how we've created online and digital content to basically show an authentic picture around what DNI means to IBM and attract people into our organization from all different backgrounds. Um, but resource groups, as well as, as what our talent at attraction team have done, is they've interlocked with every resource group we have. I think we have got 13, loads of different ones, even like, like smaller ones, like rat returning mums group, for instance. Um, and we then have meetups or hackathons or different types of in-person events where our resourcing TA function interlocks with the business community and then brings people externally into the organization to learn about our brand and obviously then put that into the top of the recruitment funnel through that process. So thinking about how you can link kind of like business DNI to like recruitment strategy and outcomes. So now we'll talk a little bit about digital. I think the key word, and I mentioned it a second ago, is authenticity. It's, I mean, we're quite lucky at IBM because of our heritage and our focus on DNI. Um, but all organizations have something, you know, to talk about which is genuine around their inclusive culture or what they're doing, or I'd hope they'd do. And I think the key is understand what that is. And then from a recruitment marketing perspective, if you don't have skills in-house, partner with a creative agency, get someone to help you build up a kind of base of all information around what you're doing, and then publicize that on digital and push that out there so people can see this is what it's like to work. And it's not it, it can't be disingenuous. It's got to be authentic. It's got to be real. So don't, you know. Anyway, let's have a let's have a look at this. This is one of the videos that we use. We've got our own DNI website, which is separate to our career site, but links in through funneling traffic through our career site. We are standing together, shoulder to shoulder, all working for one common good. And the good of each of us as individuals affects the greater good of the company. These words from our founder, Thomas J. Watson Sr., reflect IBM's past and our corporate character today. In 1899, we hired Richard McGregor, an African-American, 65 years before the Civil Rights Act of 1964. In 1914, we hired our first disabled employee, 76 years before the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act. In the 1930s, IBM continued its progressive workplace programs and policies with the arrival of professional women and equal pay for equal work and promoted its first female vice president, Ruth Leach Amanet, in 1943. Women's careers at IBM have been on the rise ever since. In 1953, Thomas J. Watson Jr. established a policy of hiring people without regard to race, color, or creed, making IBM the first US corporation to issue such a mandate. In the years that followed, this non-discrimination policy was expanded to include religion, sex, gender, gender identity or expression, sexual orientation, national origin, genetics, disability, and age. And in 2005, IBM became the first major corporation in the world to include genetics privacy in its non-discrimination policy. We push forward every day, advocating for our employees to provide stability, reassurance, and support. Just as we publicly advocated against the bathroom bills in the United States, so too have we set internal policies to extend same-sex partner benefits in 50 countries. For more than 100 years, from our founders to Ginny Rometty today, we believe that no one should face discrimination for being who they are. We are privileged to work for a company that's had the opportunity to have an impact on history in so many ways. IBMers speak with a diverse voice, representing more than 170 countries, encouraging all of us to think. So that's a little bit who are IBM. I can say honestly up here, our culture isn't fantastic everywhere. Like we have challenges, but what we've done there is basically a piece of recruitment marketing to talk about some of the stuff that we have done, some of the factual information. Um, and use that to attract talent and to push out as part of our brand messaging. Um, I'm going to talk quickly about how we've created a, trying to create a culture of inclusion and our strategy on DNI in the UK, um, in this UK market, which might be some interesting takeaways. I'm going to speed up a bit because I'm conscious of time as well. There's a lot to get through. So I'm going to whiz through this slide. Basically, our four pillars are culture, interse intersectionality, measurement and AI, and communications. Um, I'll whiz through that because it's not that interesting. The, I think the bit to share here really is um, our inclusion strategy is pre-hire to retire. So Deborah Richards, who leads um, DNI in the UK market, really 
set this up several years ago with the goal of wanting to engage right from primary school through to retirement. So when we're looking at our inclusion strategy, it spans everything from, I guess, some sort of, you know, the next generation of the workforce and early talent um, right through to our folks. So I won't read all of these off, but basically in the pre-hire space, we had loads of college, secondary, primary school, graduate, alumni going back and talking um, to their schools. And we had them doing some workshops with the kids and then also some training and enablement with some of the teachers that may not be so tech savvy, where we've got more digital tools and things, you know, like design thinking even, and things like this coming into the workplace. Um, we then sponsored events like Student Pride, Women in Tech, so on and so forth. Young professionals, then as we have our early professionals, Okay, that's all right, mate. Project and take it off if you want. Oh, is it? Is that all right now? <laughs> no, that's all right, no worries. Um, so, yeah, young professionals, basically, during onboarding, all of our early professional hires get encouraged to join all of our inclusion programs or any that are of interest to them, these ERGs that I'm talking about, um, and also go through the Be Equal training and go through different mandatory training to sort of get affiliated with that. A lot of mental health and well-being stuff as well that the business does. Then family friendly, as people are moving forward to sort of the mid mid careers, um, they've maybe even got more responsibilities about caring, you know, for elders or for children and families. So we've got a range of programs um, which are linked to that, and a carer's passport, which is actually documentation, which enables flexible working. And any manager, if you move from sort of project to project in the business, has to sort of um, allow that and enable that. Um, and then flexible benefits and policies as well. Um, and then towards retirement, basically acknowledging that people are working longer in the workplace now um, and might not want a full-time job. So what non-exec type roles could they do inside or outside of IBM? Um, what sort of, what early talent, talent attraction stuff could they get involved with? Um, developing the next generation, basically, and then other bits of advice. So that's an example of what we're doing in the UK market. And it's kind of, I guess the point that I'm saying, I know a lot of this isn't about recruitment, we'll get onto some more recruitment focused stuff as well, but getting this stuff right, working with the business and HR to put the, to create a culture of inclusion, to put the policies and procedures in place, enables recruitment to then basically take that and go and sell it to the external market and bring the talent in. Without that, what are you doing? Are you just saying, oh, we've, you know, we're, we're great, come and join us, picture of you know, a, a woman and someone in a wheelchair. And you know, it's, it's not, I don't think that's gonna wash. So that's kind of why I'm trying to share this. Um, some benefits of inclusion, I think we won't, we won't go on to all of those now, but basically, this, as I touched on, there's business benefits of inclusion. Um, you create a culture of inclusion, you have a more engaged workforce, you have lower attrition, you have a more diverse, neurodiverse workforce, you have more creativity. Um, you can then appreciate and provide a better service to your customers maybe, get better net promoter scores for those customers, a whole lot of things, a lot of the business metrics that you could track that could show um, not just basic things like retention, attrition, but um, better client satisfaction and so on. Um, we then wanted to look at how companies are activating DNI initiatives. And one of the big topics was removing bias, identifying unconscious bias, removing that, and ensuring fair processes, so process transformation. Um, education was one of the top topics that came up. So we touched on like training, like the Be Equal Badge at IBM. Lots of other organizations had similar training programs, similar awareness schemes. Um, and then in the recruitment functions, there was a lot of like stuff like diverse panels is nothing new, but you know, quite a few organizations were doing that, making sure that the interview and selection process was um, transformed in a way that it was you know, monitored and measured. Um, online accessibility, this is really interesting. We asked everyone about like, you know, accessibility around adjustments for the recruitment process. And everyone kind of referred to um, having doing sort of change where there was legislation around it, um, and maybe for people which had a visual impairment or something that you could see, and there was not so much on neurodiversity, which is why I want to come on and talk to that. Um, we also had four and five organizations say that their EVP was linked to their DNI strategy. Um, We then asked about measures and barriers. So only half of the organizations had DNI targets in place. And the measures, predominantly it's around gender. And if we look at the UK market with gender pay gap legislation, that's what's driving a lot of that. But a lot of the other areas tend to get left behind. And you can see 
poor old disability at the bottom there. Um, that's something that I'm passionate about and that we need to improve that. Um, and then we looked at barriers. So why do TA teams struggle? 78% of um, folks that we interviewed said, yeah, there are, there are fair barriers. Skill shortages. So, you know, like, I guess women in tech being a strong example or STEM skills. Um, time to fill pressure. So you might say on, on this short list, we want X percentage of candidates from this group. But then you've got the business saying, we, we have a 30 day time to fill mandate and then what do you do you know if you haven't got that recruitment marketing if you're not building that community outside then you've not got enough stuff in the top of the funnel to actually enable that um, lack of leadership support um, companies where there wasn't enough exec sponsorship where you'd go up into the hiring communities and it would be a free for and they'd do what they want um, process process and law and then bias as well so we then said in the workshop, the half-day workshop we did, how do, you, how do you measure an inclusive culture? And these were the top four things. I'm going to whistle through, though, because I'm conscious of time. Um, so I want to talk now about for five minutes or so about neurodiversity. We set up a program called Ignite. It was a pilot in 2017, and it was looking at how can we get more folks on the autism spectrum condition into the IBM workplace. In the UK market, 14% of degree-qualified folks with Asperger's, autism, ADHD, or unemployment. A lot of them have like numerical science tech degrees, so there's an 86% talent pool. Apart from the fact that these folks aren't in work, there's a massive open talent pool there. Um, so in, I think it's 88% in the US. So I'll show you this video for a couple of minutes. It talks about our neurodiversity program, and I want to talk to you about a, cha a charity called Ambitious About Autism in the, in the UK who are awesome. They have an autism exchange program, and I'd encourage everyone in the room to go and act on this as well. So let's have a quick look at this video first. I was kind of a bit naive to how I was different from everyone else. I didn't really quite have a concept of it. One day I was taken into special ed and I was given this book about what is this autism thing and what does it mean? It's like, okay, I guess that's a thing now. I only really realized what it meant later. around the time that I was seven that I knew that there was something, I don't want to say wrong, but that there was something different. I used to hardly talk. I had to learn how to do anything on my own that I didn't really do. It seemed as if there was an instruction manual that everyone else kind of had for communicating and reading other people that I did not have. I don't know how I would be handling this like uh, a year and a half ago when I wasn't working. All those skills I kind of uh, compiled into me being able to sit here and, lo and look you in the eye. Close to 80% of uh, folks in the autism spectrum are underemployed. And many of them have master's degrees, and some of them have even done PhDs. And all of them are so passionate. Uh, however, they have not found any jobs. Neurodiversity in the workplace for me is that we give everybody an opportunity. The IBM Ignite ASD program is where we have developed a pilot program where we have brought candidates that are on the autism spectrum. We see if we can place them within IBM in different capacities. So we piloted this program in 2017. We had great success of about 20 um, folks coming into the organization. And then during 2018 and this year, we've rolled it out in eight different markets. Um, Basically, what we did is we had pre-interview days where these folks could come into the organization and spend the day working with different IBMers, doing interview prep training, understanding what the interview process would be, understanding what the workplace would look like, sharing what accommodations they thought that they might need if successful in getting a job. So really kind of understanding it, getting that comfort around it, 
but then went through the interview process and then also part of it was during onboarding, making sure that we were making right accommodations. Some of those things could be simple like flexible working hours so that um, you weren't traveling into work in like a hectic working period where there was like rush hour and lots of people. So lo lots of different things like that, but quite a simple program, um, but has had a great outcome for us. Um, I then want to talk about this amazing lady, Amy Walker. Uh, at she, she spoke at IBM a few months ago at the workshop. And I should say, in this research, there's about seven or eight case studies, but I haven't, we haven't had time to talk about all of them today. But get, have a look at the white paper. It will share most of them with you. Um, Autism Exchange, basically, it's, it's similar to the Ignite program. They're a charity in the UK, and they'll come into any size of organization, and they'll basically recruit, find interns to come and work for a period of time. They will do a load of training with your workforce, the people that they'll be working with to make sure adjustments or accommodations are made, and then they'll help project manage the whole thing. Um, Amy and several interns came through this program um, with M6, which is a media agency, part of the WPP group, um, part of Group M. Um, and she's now their DNI manager. She's awesome. She come and spoke live at an event at IBM. I saw her speak at the House of Lords a few months ago. Um, so another great success story. And this is what she shared. So some of the impacts for her, she was getting tailored support training, building a network to secure a role. So really simple things that we could all do in this room without much budget or with the support of an organization at like Autism Exchange. And Amy cited a few barriers, like for the recruitment process, job descriptions, situational judgment tests. Some of us have maybe for a category of hiring certain assessment procedures. Well, you might need to change them. It might need to be flexible. It might not work. It might prevent people coming through the funnel. Um, adjustments for interviews, which we've touched on. So I'm going to rattle through. I'm going to push through this now because I'm, I'm, we're running out of time. But we can share. The, I think you'll get these slides. This is IBM's framework, some of the things that we do during the recruitment process. Um, for attraction, screening, assessment, and onboarding. Um, this was actually done by a chap called Steve Ingram, um, who's one of our consultants at IBM. He's amazing. Um, come and ask me if you've got questions about that afterwards. Third part of the research. Um, companies that are harnessing tech for DNI, And one in five companies? That's maybe why the earlier stat is that there's not enough companies out there measuring DNI and have the systems and tools in place to do so. These, you know, I'm not representing any of these companies, neither are IBM. These are just the companies that were cited um, as being used. And we've got, we've got companies there which are careers, everything from careers sites through to applicant tracking systems that focus on changing the recruitment process to make it more diversity friendly um, and job boards and all sorts of other things. But I think there's a, maybe a, a sense of technology fatigue in HR functions at the moment where there's such a um, huge impact in the market, but there are some awesome organizations out there that can help with DNI. So if you are feeling tech fatigue, try and get out of that and embrace the digital revolution and, and check out some of these guys and the others, the others that can help. Um, I'm not going to talk about this. We've got a load of stuff at I IBM that we've done. The one thing that I will talk about is CogniPay because that's probably something different to what's here. It's a tool that we've built ourselves, and it's for making fair decisions in the workforce around promotions and pay rises. So it's a tool that all of our managers have that has AI algorithms within it. And basically, what it looks at is every, em every employee in under, your, under your management, it will look at their performance. So we use success factors for performance criteria. It will pull all of their performance information from there. It will look at the external market and pull in around talent availability. So I'm a client solutions lead at IBM UK. How many of them are they in the UK market? We'll then look at, from inside, what's the criticality of the role to the business? How important? What's my ROI to the organization? So it takes different factual data points, and it pulls that into the system to say, out of these 15 people, this is their ranking on performance, availability, criticality. And as a manager, you don't have to then give pay rises on an annual basis or promotions based on that. But it helps. It takes, it takes a bias out of a decision. It, it actually, if you, if you don't, oh, I like this person because we go drinking on a Friday together. Well, no, actually, they don't get a pay rise for that. They, you know, they get it for this. So just an interesting example of like a tool that we use um, in that way. These are some of the challenges around barriers to DNI and tech-focused adoption, budget, change. That's something to do with fatigue, change fatigue. Um, capability, you don't have a team. Integration, we want everything you know, via APIs or something, but it doesn't do that. Um, so final bit. I hope I haven't bamboozled everyone information. Maybe I should have reduced it, but hopefully you're getting a few snippets and things that are interesting you can take back. Um, how can TA, TA make a bigger impact? So a lot of this was a quote that came from several different organizations that we don't have 
a mature end-to-end approach. We're looking at a point, like we will be tasked with the slate, slate or short list of candidates um, on a diversity target, but we're not actually, we don't have ownership of the end-to-end demand planning to onboarding, and we're not tasked with looking at DNI maturity throughout that. We don't own selection decisions. So part of that is you know, a really important thing around, well, what is TA's role, and how does that fit into the rest of the business? Um, I think we then had these four points, the complexity of DNI and required frameworks. Like, DNI, you know, it's a it's a beer moth. Like, there's so many different areas of it, broad and deep. Um, and we talked a little bit about changing processes for people on the autism autism spectrum. But what would you do if you had to change your recruitment process for every single different category, you know, of person or every group of person? And organisations don't have the budget, the wherewithal, the knowledge to do that. But actually, you know, I think you need to look at process transformation and maybe systems and tools that help enable that as well. Otherwise, if you're certainly, if you've got like big hiring volumes, it might be a little bit open requisition, ATS manages your recruitment workflow and it dis- discounts people and discludes people. Um, business emphasis on cost and time. Yeah, d is nice, but actually it's all about cost, it's all about time. Um, you know, we're hearing that as a challenge. Lack of budget. We already saw that, you know, saw that from one of the other ends and then end-to-end process ownership and accountability. So I'll finish on this, some, some focus areas um, and what TA teams can do to really sort of make a difference. So in enablement through sponsorship, this is really about gathering data to build the business case to help you go to the exco or whoever it is in the organization to say, firstly, we want exec sponsorship and we want this budget for next year because that's going to be the outcomes. If we're not doing that as a TA function, then we're not going to get what we need to actually start transforming. Um, talent acquisitions as custodians of fairness. That's process transformation. Owning the internal recruitment process, owning the external recruitment process, and managing that in such a way that the best talent gets through. And it's not, you know, there is no bias in there. So I think we need to, like, as TA teams, be aware of that and then have ownership of that. Um, Activate unexpected influencers. That is, you know, I think looking at, again, recruitment marketing, talent attraction. Don't do the obvious thing. Get authentic information and look right across the company for allies and people that can help influence um, the talent talent attraction strategy and what you're trying to do. Move from comms to conversation. Creating a culture of DNI isn't sending emails. It's about um, being prepared to mess up, to fail, Um, to hold your hands up and say, yeah, I didn't realize that to have a conversation about it, to hear different people's views and opinions, to learn and improve. Um, speak, don't just you know send out comms, we are what we are, this is what we do. And then finally, make it measurable. Um, yeah, I've harped on enough about that today. So I think we've run a little bit over, but that's it. <laughs>